that again. But like, I don't know what I mean, I already had it back in October. Hello, good afternoon. Okay, uh, as I'm sure you all have seen, uh, there has been a few important uh, foreign policy announcements over the last couple of days. And so we were unable to have a full briefing yesterday, and I wanted to make sure you all had an opportunity uh, to ask some questions on all of our foreign policy news. Uh, so, so today we're happy to have uh, here, join me uh, at the podium, uh, Mr. John Kirby, Admiral Kirby. Uh, and he likes to call me ma'am, so I call him Kirby. Um, I'm sure he'll call you guys sir and ma'ams as well. Um, he is the, as you all know, the National Security uh, Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications. Not only does he have an extensive military background, but he also has experience at the State Department. And he is happy to take a few questions. Uh, Kirby, I'm going to leave you to it. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, pardon me? Yeah, you too. <laughs> Um, listen, just a, just a note off the top, I think you saw the statement, but I think it's worth reiterating. The president had a, a very good call today with President Zelensky of Ukraine. Uh, it was an opportunity for President Zelensky to update President Biden on uh, what's going on on the battlefield, on the ground, uh, and to talk to the president uh, about uh, Ukraine's security uh, requirements and capabilities going forward. The president also obviously took this opportunity to inform President Zelensky that we're announcing today, I think you saw a billion dollars in additional security assistance to support Ukraine's armed forces and their brave defense of their country. Now, that includes a drawdown of security assistance valued up to $350 million. That's where the Department of Defense pulls from their stocks, uh, as well as $650 million in equipment that's provided through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative funds. That's where the, the Pentagon will go out and procure uh, material according in, in that amount to then just provide directly to Ukraine. So there are two different buckets of that billion dollars. Now, this is the 12th time that President Biden has authorized presidential drawdowns to help Ukraine defend its democracy, and that brings the total amount of security assistance that we provided to Ukraine to approximately $5.6 billion just since Russia launched its assault uh, in late February, uh, and then approximately $6.3 billion since the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration. The President also informed President Zelensky that the United States is going to send an additional $225 million in life-saving humanitarian assistance 
to help people inside Ukraine obtain safe drinking water, critical medical supplies, health care, food, shelter, and all kinds of other essential uh, items. I think you all realize the scope uh, of the, uh, the numbers of internally displaced people just inside Ukraine, let alone the millions that have had to leave Ukraine. So since February 24th, the United States has now then provided more than $914 million in humanitarian assistance to address the needs of people in Ukraine and for those who have had to flee. So that's almost a billion dollars just in humanitarian assistance. Right. And with that, ready? I'm ready. Okay, we have questions. Thank you, sir. Um, you bet. And my question is more about the temperature in Europe uh, surrounding as you guys are continuing to crank up aid. But today, um, President Macron said that at some point, Ukraine's president will have to negotiate with Russia. Uh, and that seems quite different from what President Biden and many administration officials, including I think you have said, about the need uh, of stressing not telling the Ukrainians what to do. Would the administration prefer uh, the French and also other Europeans to sort of dial down the nudging? Well, I think we'll let uh, other foreign leaders speak for themselves and, uh, and, and for their countries and for their national interests. I think that's appropriate. But nothing's changed about President Biden's view here is that uh, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine and that it, Ukraine is a sovereign country. President Zelensky is the democratically elected leader of that country, and he gets to determine um, how this war ends. He gets to determine um, how he defines victory and, and how he gets at that outcome. Real quick, another uh, small associated Russian question. Navalny um, confirmed today on Telegram that he was moved to a maximum security prison uh, in uh, Vladimir, I believe. Have you guys been able to confirm that? And second, is there any sort of response to uh, the Russians moving them into even stricter confinement? Yeah, well, we're not, I don't think we're in a position to absolutely confirm the reports. Certainly, we're also in no position to, to refute them at this time. Obviously, Mr. Navalny speaking for himself. Uh, but I would tell you, we continue to reiterate uh, our demand for his immediate and unconditional release uh, from, uh, from being imprisoned over spurious charges after a sham trial. Um, and the Russian, Russian authorities ought to immediately uh, end their harassment uh, and intimidation against him and his supporters, and again, continue to call for his immediate and unconditional release. Peter. Uh, I have a question about U.S. national security. How is it that you guys have determined that it's in the U.S. national security interest to ask Saudi Arabia to drill more oil? Uh, instead of just letting oil companies drill more here in the U.S.? Well, I think you know, uh, Peter, there's uh, some 9,000 unused drilling permits here in the United States uh, as well. Um, look, um, the, uh, the oil production issue is a global issue, uh, and OPEC plus three has already increased preset increases by more than 50 percent just for <clears throat> July and, uh, and August, uh, and we're grateful to Saudi Arabia's leadership on that. But we've never said that uh, we've never said it's a national security interest that somebody has to pump more oil. Uh, and again, there's there's unused permits here in the United States. Uh, and but as a national strategic issue, then uh, how is it in the uh, how much lower can we let the strategic petroleum reserves get before that becomes a problem? I, I think I would uh, refer to the president's uh, energy advisors on something like that, Peter. I, I, I don't uh, I don't know what the inventory is, but I do you know remind, and I think you know this, the president did uh, tap into the strategic oil, oil reserves to try to relieve some of the pressure at, at the pump, um, and he'll use a range of, of tools available to him going forward. I think that's about the best I can do on that. Thanks, Reed. I have a Saudi question, but first, can you comment, or what does the White House have to say about these two Americans that have been captured that were fighting alongside Ukrainian forces, they're, or they're missing, they're feared captured by the Russians? Yeah, can't confirm the reports, Caitlin. Just was made aware of them before I came out here. Uh, we'll do the best we can to monitor this and see what we can learn about it. Um, um, and, uh, well, well, without getting into hypothetical, obviously, if it's true, we'll do everything we can to, to, uh, to get them uh, safely back home. I do think, however, that this is um, an important point uh, in time to remind that we discourage Americans from going to Ukraine and, and fighting in Ukraine. It is a war zone. It is, it's, it's combat. Um, and if you feel passionate about supporting Ukraine, there's any number of other ways to do that uh, that are safer and, and, and just as effective. I, we, we just 
the, the Ukraine is not the place for Americans to be traveling. And has the president been made aware of these reports? I, I'm not aware that the pr president has been made aware of it. I mean, it just it just bro broke, so I don't and know. And my question on Saudi Arabia, why not have the president go there and just not meet with the crown prince? The president's going to Saudi for the GCC, the GCC plus three, to be honest. Uh, it's nine states. Uh, in the region. There's a big agenda there, Caitlin, uh, on the Gulf Cooperation Account Council. It's counterterrorism, it's climate change, certainly it's oil production, obviously is going to be on the agenda, and, and, and a big item on the agenda is the war in Yemen. Uh, we got a, a, a ceasefire now that's been in place for two months, got extended another two. That's a big deal. That's thousands of lies now in Yemen. I so, understand there's a lot to talk about, but why, if the president won't even speak to the crown prince on the phone, why would he go and meet with him in person? You no, know, I was kind of getting there. So in addition to the GCC meeting, uh, there'll be a ser series of bilateral discussions, as there are on the sidelines of, of all uh, uh, cooperation councils and, uh, and summits. He will have a bilateral meeting with King Salman and King Salman's leadership team, and the Crown Prince is on that leadership team. So you can expect that he'll see the Crown Prince while he's there. But he could ask for the Crown Prince not to be in the room, given the CIA has concluded he authorized the murder of a reporter that lived in Virginia. He's going to have a series of bilateral discussions with the, the kings, the king and his leadership team, the crown prince, is the defense minister of Saudi Arabia, and one would expect that he would need to be in the room for those meetings. John, the back. Okay. Trevor Honeycutt from uh, Reuters. Uh, just wanted to uh, close the loop first on the meeting that uh, President Biden had with Bolsonaro of Brazil last week. There's been some reporting that suggested that Biden told Bolsonaro that he would re-examine steel tariffs, uh, Brazilian steel, steel tariffs and that um, Bolsonaro asked him for support in the October election against Lula. Uh, are either of those things true? I think we gave a pretty fulsome readout of that meeting, uh, when, uh, the trip that Kareem was on. I don't have anything more to add than, okay. than what was in the readout. About those two issues, yeah. but I'm not going to go beyond the read. Yeah. And then on, on uh, China tariffs, it, but we know that that's something that the president is looking at. Could you talk a little bit about, um, one, the scope of, of the tariffs that he is looking at, and if you expect that that will be finalized by, say, the end of July? I would just go so far as to say is the, the, the president wants to make sure that if we have tariffs in place that they're serving our interests and the interests of the American people. Um, and uh, and he wants to make sure that as he reviews the, a, t a tariff regime that it's, that it's meeting those needs. And uh, I think he's going to uh, keep his mind open, but I don't have any more detail than that. I'll take some of go ahead. Go ahead. Thank, thanks very much. Um, two, two quick questions, please. Uh, one, on following the latest Xi Putin call, uh, where apparently Xi was talking about um, expanding cooperation with the, uh, with the Russians. Ha has there been any sign so far, and do you see any sign coming that China is actually helping Russia militarily in any shape or form? No, we haven't seen any indication that there's been specific military assistance provided by China to Russia. And the other question, um, could you give it a little bit more on the president's comments yesterday about these grain silos being, uh, the plan to build grain silos on the borders of Ukraine, uh, what's, this, what's the time scale of that and what's the scale of that and how much difference would it make? Yeah, look, I think we're working uh, real hard, uh, not just uh, with the leadership in Ukraine but, but in the region um, to try to relieve the pressure uh, that has resulted from Mr. Putin literally weaponizing food. Uh, and so the president's looking at a range of options here to uh, to try to see if we can get grain out and into the market. Um, and that's a that's tricky business. That's not going to be easy. I mean, he's essentially got a blockade in the Black Sea where it's not going out by by sea. So that doesn't leave you a whole lot of other options. And we're working through with the international community to do that. I don't have any additional information on options about uh, temporary silos. But I can tell you that, again, the president's keeping an open mind here. He wants to do everything he can to try to get that grain to market. Maria. Maria. Thank you. Hi, George. Um, despite your, uh, I'm going back to Ukraine, despite your announcement today of the military aid to Ukraine, uh, it seems that Europe is divided between two camps. They call it the peace camp, led by uh, France and Germany, Italy, and the justice camp, led by Poland and others, which is basically some want Ukraine to negotiate and others want them to continue fighting. Where does the United States stand? And uh, the fact that you keep supplying them with weapons, does that mean that you are with Poland and the Baltic states and others? The, the president's on the side of the people of Ukraine. And uh, he wants to make sure that, uh, that we're doing everything we can to help Ukraine's armed forces succeed on the battlefield. And to give them, if and when this gets to a negotiation, that they have 
the 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 leverage and the uh, and, and the position they need uh, in that. But ultimately, Nadia, that's going to be up to Mr. Zelensky to determine. Uh, he is the democratically elected leader of a sovereign state, and their sovereignty is what's at risk right now. And he wants to make sure that that sovereignty is preserved, that they that they get to decide what that looks like. question of an investigation around the death of Sharina Blackley, the Al Jazeera journalist and U.S. citizen. Yeah. Um, I know that Secretary of State Antony Blinken said last week that he would look for an independent investigation, and I was wondering if you all could explain what type of investigation this administration wants. I know a number of news outlets, Washington Post, CNN, AP have come out for their investigations, and then also we've seen Mitt Romney and I believe it was John Ossoff um, write a letter to the administration calling for an investigation. So what type of investigation would you want? What does an independent investigation Well, what, what we want is obviously for this to be fully investigated. And if there needs to be accountability had, accountability had at the end of that investigation. We've called uh, for uh, thorough, complete, transparent investigations uh, in, into her death. Um, and we're going to be watching this very, very closely. I don't have any additional details uh, on what an independent investigation would look like. I, I just don't have that for you today. But I don't want you to walk away thinking that we don't want this fully investigated and for that investigation to be thorough and transparent. Is this something the president intends to discuss on his trip? I mean, he is going to two countries, as Caitlin mentioned, where journalists have recently been killed and there has been a lot of public <clears throat> outcry. And I know you all talk a lot here about press freedoms, and I'm sure we all appreciate it, but I'm just curious how that's going to come up both in Israel and It means Israel. a lot to President Biden, press freedom. and. Uh, uh, I won't get ahead of the president's specific discussions on this trip. Uh, I can just tell you that uh, that uh, his foreign policy is really rooted in values, uh, values like freedom of the press, values like human rights, civil rights, and he's not going to be bashful about raising those issues with any foreign leader anywhere in the world. Okay, last two, Justin, and then Ed. Thanks. Um, I, I want to ask you about uh, Turkish President Erdogan today uh, said that his uh, concerns about Sweden and Finland joining NATO have not been a swatch, so how much less optimistic are you now that a session talks might begin before uh, this month's summit in Madrid, and does the U.S. plan to get more directly involved to try to resolve that dispute? We're still optimistic that uh, that these issues will be able to be worked out and that Finland and Sweden will be able to join NATO. Now, I couldn't give you a, d a date certain here and a time, but I think we're still uh, optimistic that uh, they'll be able to work this out, and we know that both countries are working directly with Turkey uh, to try to address those concerns. And I think we think at this point it's better left to them uh, as sovereign nations to do that. All right, Ed, last question. Just two on Ukraine, and uh, welcome to the room. And, um, going back first to, you talked about food and how it's being weaponized uh, mm -hmm. by Putin in Ukraine, and that there are U.S. officials starting to discuss how to get grain and whatnot out of yeah. Ukraine and to the areas of the world that need it. Uh, big area of the world that needs it also happens to be uh, countries that will be at that conference in Saudi Arabia and OPEC producing countries. Yeah. Um, can you say any more about what's being considered or what's being done potentially to get that out and, and whether or to what extent that agreement stretches regionally beyond the Ukraine and the United States being concerned about it? What I can say is that uh, we're working very hard inside the international community here to try to find solutions. And, you know, You've heard us talk about this quite some time, and I talked about it even from my uh, uh, previous perch at the, at, the, at the Pentagon. It's difficult to do when you're talking about a country that's at war. I mean, and we've already seen the ability of uh, the Russians to strike long-range targets all the way to the west of the, in, in the country. Um, so this has to be – everybody has – everybody understands the sense of urgency here and the importance of it. Uh, but there also has to be uh, some very careful thought put into how you're going to do this. And you're going to have to have international cooperation and support to do it, particularly um, if you're looking at ground routes. So uh, while I don't have a specific plan to brief you today or a set of you know options here, uh, I can assure you that, the, again, the President's keeping an open mind. He's working directly with his interlocutors around the world to try to find ways to get this grain to market. We all understand how important it is. We're all mindful uh, of the sense of urgency here not just from an economic perspective, but from, from a, a humanitarian perspective. I mean, th this, this is food. This is, uh, this is sustenance for, for, for people and their livelihoods. So we're working it really, really hard. Potentially, especially in North Africa and the Middle East. I mean, or, or, well, around the world, certainly, but in the region and in North Africa. One other, you mentioned all the money that's being distributed and a billion more today. Does the White House currently foresee the need for Congress 
at some point to pass another major multi-billion dollar aid package? You know, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, uh, we're just now beginning uh, to spend on the $40 billion supplemental that Congress approved, and we're grateful for that, of course. Um, you will see additional packages coming um, on, a, on a fairly routine basis here. And we want to meter it out so that we're in lockstep with the Ukrainians and where they are on the battlefield and what they need in real time. That's why conversations like today with President Zelensky are so important. The contact group that Secretary Austin is hosting uh, right now in Brussels, 50-some-odd nations also putting forward other uh, materials for security assistance. But you need to do it because it's a war and it's active combat and it changes from day to day. You kind of need to do it in almost real time. So we're going to meter these out over time to, so that we're appropriately meeting what Ukraine needs. Um, and right now, I just don't think we're at a stage where we think we need to go back uh, for more at this time. But in terms of that $40 billion, none of it's been spent yet? Or well, we just announced, we just announced that, that, that this billion is coming right out of that. That's, yes, sir. That's awesome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is the president tracking negotiation in Ethiopia? We know that more people have died there than in Ukraine. You know what? I'm going to have to take that question, and uh, we'll see if we can get you a, a better answer. I don't know. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Okay. I have a couple of things for you at the top. Um, so. Uh, wanted to provide you an update on our work to lower gas prices for American people. As you know, uh, the president has taken historic actions to address Putin's price hi hike at the pump. He is releasing he is releasing a record one billion barrels of oil a day from the Strategic Petro Petroleum Reserve. He has r rallied our partners to join uh, releasing an additional 240 million barrels of oil. Uh, he expanded access to E15, which will lower prices at thousands of gas stations, but oil companies need to step up too. And the president made that clear in a letter to major U.S. oil refiner refiners today. And I have a chart behind me. In a, in a time of global crisis, oil companies should be doing everything they can to expand capacity and lower cost at the pump. Instead, they are charging record profits at the expense of American families. The last time the price of crude oil was $120 a barrel. The price of gas was 425 cents a gallon. Today, it's about 75 cents higher. As you can see uh, through the chart behind me here, that difference is a result of companies' record high profit margins uh, for refining oil. Profit margins have tripled. You can see it right there at the end over here uh, since the beginning of, of the year. So right here, as you see, uh, diesel and gas. They should be putting those record profits into expanding refining capacity from back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, President Biden is putting a spotlight on this and calling on oil ref refiners to invest those records, those record profits to increase capacity so cost at the pump could come down. He is signaling that he is prepared to use any emergency tools he has, but these companies have a responsibility to step up too. Uh, we are focused on getting to solutions. Uh, we are also closely monitoring uh, the extreme heat conditions impacting many Americans across the country, and the president has been briefed uh, regularly, including today. Uh, federal agencies are working with state and local partners to provide clear, ac accessible, and timely information on extreme heat and how people can protect themselves. We are also protecting workers, including through a new administration initiative to proactively inspect over 70 high-risk industries in areas under a heat warning or advisory. Our team is also in contact with the Department of Interior on the horrific and catastrophic floods at Yellowstone National Park, and the President was briefed about this as well today. We are grateful for the brave and swift work of federal and state first responders to help get people in Yellowstone National Park and in surrounding communities to safety. We know the impacts of extreme weather are intensifying and no one is immune from climate change, as you hear us talk about uh, for this past year and a half. That is why President Biden has made tackling climate crisis one of his top priorities. 
Today, as well, we are also com com commemorating the 10-year anniversary of DACA, which President Biden considers one of his proudest uh, moments, accomplishments, uh, with President Obama when he was uh, then Vice President. President Biden shared a video messaging, message marking the anniversary, and Vice President Harris, the First Lady, and Ambassador Susan Rice are also hosting meetings uh, with DREAMers and DACA recipients here at the White House. In 10 years, DACA has transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of young people who were brought here as children who only know America as their home. DREAMers contribute to their community in ways big and small. They are on the front lines of the pandemic. Others are job creators and entrepreneurs entrepreneurs, many serve in our military. The president is committed to preserving and fortifying DACA, but as he said in his State of the Union address, we need to provide a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, and he continues to call on Congress to pass a bill that does just that, uh, and he would be ready to sign it right away. Uh, finally, this is the last thing here, uh, following today's briefing, right, we know we have to gather at, uh, for, you all have to gather at 345, so try and take as many questions as possible. The president will sign an executive order advancing uh, equality for LGBTQI plus individuals, which includes historic steps to support LGBTQI plus families and children. The, e the EO directs federal agencies to address extreme legislative attacks, help put an end to con conversion therapy, improve mental health care, and prevent youth suicide, launch a new initiative to protect foster youth, and prevent homelessness and more. These are historic actions that build on the progress we have made advancing equality for LGBTQI plus Americans and people around the world, but the federal government can and most and can and must do more. It's critically by Congress passing the Equality Act, the president will renew his call for Congress to send a bill to his desk. And with that, Amr, you want to take this? Yes. Um, Fed officials expect the unemployment rate will rise to 3.9% next year as they move to lower inflation. inflation. Um, does the White House uh, think slightly higher unemployment is an acceptable trade-off uh, to fix inflation? So, I mean, here's the reality that we're in and the facts are we brought unemployment down below 4% 4 per, 4%. you've heard most recently at 3.6 uh, four years faster uh, than forecasters thought was possible uh, before we passed the American Rescue Plan which was over a year ago back in last April of 2021 part of that means a transition over the course of the next year uh, we have added an average of more than 400,000 jobs per month in recent months uh, to something clo closer like a cool down if you will to the range of 150,000 jobs per month. That would be consistent with the unemployment rate as low as it is now with the 3.6. Uh, that will be a, a good thing and a sign of a healthy a economy uh, and, and, a, and also a transition as we are going, as we are headed towards. Uh, let, me, let me just call people I haven't called on yet. Go ahead. Um, in the letter from the president to the oil refinery, the refiners, he said they need to work with the administration to yeah. bring about a near-term solution. Is there an or else in there from the president? Is, is there some way that the administration plans to try to hold these count, uh, companies accountable? You use the word responsibility in your message right. at the top we, here. We see it as a patriotic duty. Um, as we're, as we are, um, uh, as we've talked about, there's war happening uh, right now in Ukraine that was caused by uh, caused by Russia, which is why we're seeing uh, the, these hikes in gas prices, uh, especially with, as, since since Russia has amassed uh, started amassing uh, troops on the border. We saw a, we've seen a two dollar uh, increase of gas prices. So we know where to put the blame on the war, but. Uh, oil companies, they have oil refineries, they have responsibility too. What they have been doing is taking advantage of the war. And as, as I showed earlier, they have tripled uh, uh, tripled their, uh, their, their income. And so this is a problem. But what we're trying to do by putting out the letter, we are saying, hey, we need you to act. It is time to act. We want to have a conversation. We want to come to a solution. Uh, there is 
going to be a, 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 a conversation later this this week, I believe, with the uh, en energy department. Uh, and so that's going to happen. So this is basically a, a bit of a, hey, we want, we want you to act. It's time to act. We have done our part with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the one, uh, the, the one million uh, a day for the next six months. And so we need them to act. So that's where we are. We want to come to solutions, which is why we say we want to have that conversation. And we'll, we'll see where it goes from and there. Is there something the president is considering to compel them or a consequence if that does I, not I happen? don't have anything right now to, to preview as to what would come what would come next. But what I will say is that we are we are calling on them to do the right thing, to be patriots here, uh, and not to use the war uh, as an excuse or as a as a reason uh, to not put to not put out a production, not to not do the capacity that is needed out there, uh, so that the prices can so that the prices can come down. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I, should, I probably should have called somebody who I haven't called on, but go ahead. Uh, just very go ahead. quickly. We're really quick. The Atlanta Fed um, economic forecast uh, puts real GDP growth for the second quarter at 0.0. .0. A percent now, um, with the United States potentially on the knife's edge of a 70s style stagflationary kind of period, um, I'm curious about kind of your policy preferences. Um, do you expect that the administration will prioritize stimulus to get growth higher um, and curtail unemployment, or do you think that you will you will continue to favor deficit reduction to get inflation down? I mean, look, the president laid out in his um, in his uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed very recently what he's doing, the points that he's taking uh, to, to make sure that we are fighting inflation, attacking inflation. Uh, one of them is giving the Fed its independence uh, and, uh, and allowing them to deal with inflation under pur their purview. They have the best monetary policies uh, to do that, and so we want to give that independence there. And of course, he has taken actions, as I said early on in, uh, in, in the beginning of the briefing, on things that will help uh, ease that ease the cost uh, for families. We understand gas prices are high. We understand the president understands what it means to have uh, food prices. Again, that's connected to Putin's war uh, uh, against uh, Ukraine and them attacking another country's sovereignty. That's what we're seeing uh, uh, happening there. And so we are going to continue to do everything that we can. We feel that we are in a uh, transition right now from a uh, economic uh, uh, historic economic growth recovery and so going into that transition with stability and steady uh, steady growth uh, we feel that's going to help with inflation so we're going to just focus on uh, the points that the president laid out in his uh, in his op-ed i'm going to i'm going to move on so i can get other people it's okay. go, oh go, go, you sure i'm fine yeah. oh my gosh okay let me let me get um I'm going to get you, and then I'll, I'll start moving around so I can be done with the first row. Are there other <laughs> industries that you think need to step up in a patriotic fashion to try to help reduce inflation or costs for Americans? So I don't. I, I, there's not a list that I have right now for you. Right now, we we want to focus on the oil refinery, which is why we put out the letter um, uh, uh, today or yesterday. I'm losing my my track of time, and so we see that as an important first step. Uh, in making sure that the oil refineries are doing their their part again, patriotic duty in making sure that they're putting out capacity and they're not uh, taking advantage of a t uh, of of a war uh, that is hurting the American public. And so we're going to have hopefully we're going to have we're going to have a conversation. We're going to get to a solution uh, and move this forward. The president often talks about being a capitalist, and obviously market forces drive a lot of that. So how? would he find the balance between trying to encourage them to do more without looking like he is trying to move a sector of the private uh, industry? I mean, look, the facts are the facts, uh, Kelly O. We, what we have seen is they are not, their, their capacity is not there. And they, and right from the chart, they are using this moment, using this moment of war uh, and where the American, where American families are feeling, uh, are feeling the high cost with food and gas I mean, that is not a patriotic thing to do. And the person, uh, the president has the right to call them out. And so he's using his perch. He's using uh, this opportunity uh, that he has uh, to make sure that he always said he's going to use every lever that he can uh, to make sure he's delivering for the American people. And that's what he's, he's going to try and do at this point. Thank you. Yeah. Progressives in Congress are calling for the passage of a windfall profits tax targeting the oil and gas sector. What's the president's position on that? Uh, I, I don't have a position for you to, sh to share at this time well, on that. To oil analysts, they say the one thing we all ought to be concerned about is the prospect of a hurricane hitting refineries on the Gulf Coast. Are you aware of any steps the administration is taking now to gird against that possibility? I, I don't have anything on, uh, on 
on uh, hurricane at this moment, like what we're going to do to take steps on, on hurricane and oil refinery. I'm happy to check in with the team and get back to you uh, to see if there is a, pl a plan in place. Uh, but th I don't have anything for you at this time. One more quick thing. Sure, sure, sure. The, the, the country's refineries are aging. Um, a, a major refinery really hasn't been built in this country since the late 1970s. If uh, one were to be proposed, would the president support the construction of a new refinery or oppose it? Uh, that one, I've not seen any of that reporting, um, and that is uh, not something that I can confirm from the podium at this time. Okay. Do you want to go, hey, Andrew? Thanks. Just to try one more time on, on the refinery issue. Yeah. Um, in the letter, the president said that he's prepared to use all reasonable and appropriate federal government tools and emergency authorities to increase refining capacity. What are those tools exactly that he has? So, look, he is open to all reasonable uses of federal government's tools uh, to increase output and lower cost uh, at the pump, including emergency authorities uh, like the Defense Production Act. Uh, already, the president has demonstrated his willingness uh, to use that emergency powers to lower costs for families. As as I've mentioned, the petroleum, uh, the, the strategic petroleum reserve, as we, we're using right now, um, to get uh, to get oil every day, to make sure we're we're doing everything we can to lower costs. The uh, ethanol 15, the the homegrown biofuels, uh, that is going to help. Uh, many, many families uh, across the country, including in the Midwest. So that's a, a way that the president has acted. Um, and so he is going to, author he authorized the use of DPA to accelerate domestic production of key energy technologies as well. And so the letter, just to put, put in context for a second, uh, the letter is intended to solicit companies' uh, best ideas on how to increase capacity and how the government can help them do it in the spirit of the earnest and pragmatic dialogue. But we feel like this is a good step for us to move forward and hopefully we'll come and get some solutions. So you're you could use the Defense Production Act to expand capacity? Uh, well, we're, we, I don't have anything to share in specifically how we would use the DPA, but we're saying that the president has used it before, uh, and uh, and he's willing to do that again. But the the first the first step that he wants to do is make sure to have the conversation and hear ideas, right, from the oil refineries how we can be uh, how we can be helpful to them uh, to actually get more capacity out. Okay. I'll take I'll take like two more. I'll take two more. Go ahead. Thanks very thanks very much. Um, we're, we're just about to go into a pride event, uh, yeah. obviously. Um, so we know that Saudi officials have been seizing rainbow-colored toys and clothing as part of an apparent crackdown on homosexuality in the country there. Mm. That's according to state-run media. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the White House uh, response is to that, given that the President's about to set up his um, pride credentials in the, in the next event. So I have not seen that reporting, but what I can say globally, uh, we work around the, the globe to protect LGBTQI plus persons from violence and abuse, uh, criminalization, discrimination, and stigma, and and empower local LGBTQI plus movements and persons. Uh, we do this through bilateral and multilateral channels, uh, raising official concerns with governor governments, both principal and privately, uh, coordinating our efforts with like-minded countries, and offering offering emergency assistance to LGBTQI plus persons at risk. Through our foreign assistance program, programming, we support civil society in providing LGBTQI plus individuals and communities with tools and resources to prevent, mitigate, and recover from violence, discrimination, and st stigma. We see human rights as being universal. I'm going to take so one last like more. Well, I'm going to take one last one. I'm going to take one last one. Go, go ahead, Ben. Go ahead. Jamal Khashoggi's fiance said today she was, quote, very disappointed. President Biden plans to meet with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. She said in a message to the president, quote, if you have to put oil over principles and expediency over values, can you at least ask where is Jamal's body? And quote, what happened to his killers? So will President Biden ask the Crown Prince these questions? Um, you know, first I want to say, you know, um, just hearing that it's devastating, right? It is, um, uh, it is Jamal Khashoggi's widow, and so clearly our hearts go out to her and the pain that she's currently uh, going through. Um, you know, when it comes to human rights, this is not something, uh, the president is a straight shooter. 
Um, this is not something that he's afraid to talk about. He has those conversations, uh, leader to leader to conversations on a regular basis. Uh, I cannot read out right now or lay, or lay out what the agenda is going to be or what the conversations are going to be. Uh, but I can assure you, I can assure you that when it comes to human rights, this is something uh, that is um, a, a priority for this president. I just laid out uh, how I, at the end of talking about the LGBTQ uh, I plus community, how human rights is universal, and that is very, very true uh, in in uh, in many ways. And so, um, uh, I, I, once we have more to share, we'll share more about what the trip will look like. Okay, I have to go. I gotta go, guys. I, I gotta go, guys. In town pool and pre-credential media, please gather at the.